Hi, so great. Okay, the screen appears to be working. I thought I'd choose the longest password imaginable. Um, my name is Jeff Kember. Uh, I worked in production for about 20 years at companies such as Framestore, Pixar, ILM, and I've spent the last three years working at Google. I'm a technical director in the office of the CTO, which is an engineering group within the company. We have a combination of CTOs, CIOs, product management, engineering, and we work with enterprise customers to try and expose some of the technology that Google makes to allow them to be um, a little more cutting edge and uh, prosper. So one of the uh, things that I'm really excited about is artificial intelligence, and we just had a fantastic presentation, so thank you for that. Um, we're gonna talk a little more specifics about machine learning. I'm gonna give a few different examples and uh, hopefully provide some insight for you on where we can go with that. So I'm sure in the media, everyone's talking about, you know, you're, you're reading all about machine learning. There's a huge amount of hype right now. Um, you can see, you know, the next step from the peak hype is the trough of disillusionment. Um, that, you know, the idea of this is gonna solve all your problems, it's the next big thing. Um, we're taking a slightly more measured approach to it and trying to identify what avenues there are today that we can apply to the um, problems that we have to solve, uh, in addition, where it could go in the future. So I also am a huge fan of Kubrick in 2001, and this is one of the things that put me into the film industry back in the day was I wanted my Hell 9000 or my cell. Um, it always seemed like it was just around the corner, and yet it hasn't come yet. If you're a fan of XKCD, um, this is a, an example of unsupervised learning, um, and it looks like just a bunch of maths that are kind of blown out of proportion at this point. So for us, machine learning is a branch of artificial intelligence, but it's also an enablement to create machines that improve themselves over time. We like the idea that it is a opportunity to solve problems without having to explicitly codify the solution. So there's, there's three different types of machine learning that I'm gonna talk about today. Um, supervised learning, where you have a specific output in mind. You, there's something you wanna find. Um, the example given earlier was a horse or a cat. Um, that would be you know, image-based recognition. Unsupervised learning is a little different. It's uh, typically a large data set, and you're in a scenario where you want to find, well, you, you wanna see what comes out of that data set, but you don't have an explicit uh, output. Reinforcement learning, uh, which we're gonna talk about with DeepMind, uh, and deep learning uh, is the idea of having a self-learning algorithm that can go through, look at the results of its initial output, and then be able to modify the model that it's using as well as the graph that it's operating with. So keys to successful ML, um, massive data sets are helpful. I'll talk a little bit about ImageNet and I'll work with that. Um, good models, I'll be chatting about different ways to make models and the pros and cons of them, as well as a ridiculous amount of compute doesn't hurt. So, we're gonna go back in time a little bit, more than a decade. Um, you know, everyone here has a GPU under their desk and on their phone in their pocket. When you started looking at neural nets, it became clear that because GPUs have a limited instruction set but a massive parallelization capability, the idea of using commodity GPUs from gaming and visualization to be able to do machine learning, um, that became a thing. So we had a, roughly an order of magnitude increase that came out of GPUs. Beifei is a fantastic PhD Stanford machine learning expert, and she leads a team on cloud at Google. And in 2012, in her work with ImageNet, um, she was able to come up with a neural net framework that you can see had a variety of level of success back in 2012. So the picture on the left, yes, person riding motorcycle on the dirt road, that's solid, describes the image, no errors, that's, that's what that is. Um, minor errors would be number two, the dog, there's obviously three dogs in the frame. The system only found two. Uh, the third one, model needed more training. You know, it's not a skateboarder. There was a trick on a ramp, so it, you know, somewhat related to the image. But this is what we're finding um, in models that aren't sufficiently well-trained with too small a data set, that you, your accuracy drops off when you start presenting it with new information it hasn't seen before. It'll give you metadata that's, that's potentially useful, but it's very important to be able to have an expectation on accuracy. So many of the models that we use will have a percentage accuracy. So it'll give you the tag, but it'll also tell you how close we think that is for accuracy. So again, the important thing about this is the system is learning like a two or three year old would. It's using um, language we've given it, but it's also trying to identify imagery based on a data set we provided it. But when you provide it data outside of that data set, it's gonna apply that. And this is a, your results will, will vary. However, being that it's late 2017, we have significantly better results at this point and higher performance. So Dennis at 
Deep Mind is the CEO, and he wanted to create an artificial intelligence that was a general purpose AI. So instead of hand coding an AI for a specific task, he wanted to create a general purpose AI, which could be given a variety of tasks without specific training specialized to the task. Instead, it would be, here's some rule or framework to work within, and away you go and see how you do. So the, with, with general AI, the idea is to try and solve a problem the way humans do. And so in this framework, you go out and you make observations, you then run them through your machine learning graph in the system, and then you take appropriate actions to it, go back out in the environment, do additional observations. So this is sort of the general framework for a general AI system um, with an end goal, ideally. One of the issues we have as humans is dopamine is our friend. It's, a, it's our, our natural reinforcer. When we do well, we get it, it's great. Teaching a general purpose AI dopamine, giving it an incentive to win, was a challenge originally. And the idea of emulating the hippocampus in terms of being able to have the, the dreamlike state while you're awake, um, these were some of the artificial intelligence constructs that the DeepMind team had to overcome. So when I first saw this example, uh, I, you know, this is how I play it, um, you know, just randomly moving around. I'm slightly better than this, but not much. Um, so after two hours, the AI system, now granted here, the only thing that's being streamed is pixels and a score, that's it. There's no rules being given to the system. So we go from this, which is just moving around at random, to um, really articulated, getting the acceleration correct, being able to bounce it off the wall and such, and in not much longer, we get a strategy here. And I love this when I saw it, because bam, up the side and then across the top. So this is the way to get the highest amount of score in the fewest number of minutes. So then from there, they took that same algorithm and fed it all the games from my youth. My youth, Atari 2600, here we go, 50 games. We're talking pole position, we're talking pitfall, and the system was able to do extremely well and play all these games. There was another example that I don't have a video for, but it is a, um, a NASCAR style car simulator where the tires wear down over time. And the, the car, the, the system it was able to play overnight and they came back and looked at the overnight run. And what they found was sometime around four or five in the morning, the system had worn its tires down and actually spun the car on the track, but it applied the correct steering throttle input to be able to stop the rotation after one time. I, you know, I looked over at the person sitting beside me going, oh, that's kind of scary that this, this happened overnight and the system's driving a car around a track. So, I'm sure people in the room have heard of AlphaGo. Uh, anybody want to raise their hand on this? A couple of people, great, thank you, okay. So the idea was to say chess was a hard problem and that's been solved um, with purpose-built equipment and that was an amazing achievement. AlphaGo it has just a ridiculous number of moves. It's anywhere from 80 to 200 moves every move. The permutation tree just gets ridiculous. So Google went out and built proprietary custom hardware accelerators I'll talk about a little later. Um, but the idea about this is they took thousands of, of human games, well, actually hundreds of thousands of human games, and fed them into a system, and were, was able, they were able to develop a learning algorithm that could effectively beat the world champion. So um, it was a four out of five match the first time they went to it, and then it's been consistent um, at, at, at being the top player in the world. So just last Wednesday, however, AlphaGo Zero was released, and this is something that I want to nerd out about for a little minute, because I thought, I think it's really cool. Um, so instead of hundreds of thousands of games for training, this system is a self-learning system where the, it was only programmed with the rules of the game. So in about three days, this system was able to play itself and not have any human construct issues. It was able to beat the best version of AlphaGo after three days of play. And then after roughly 40 days of training, it was able to get a 90th percentile win against the highest evolved version that was played against humans. Now, what, what came out of this uh, from the research I found particularly compelling was the fact that there were certain moves. There's, there's, this game is you know, very popular in China and there's historical significance to it. And there are specific moves that just aren't done. Uh, there's this fifth column move, I know nothing about it, but the idea that it was introduced by the AI as a competing winning move and that has now been propagated into the common play uh, that everyone else has picked up. So the AI developed this new technique that was outside of the normal constructs and now we have this synergy where you can go back and forth and play new moves maybe humans hadn't thought of. 
StarCraft II, uh, a game near and dear to my heart. Um, I worked at Blizzard for a couple of years and I had the opportunity to play this game, uh, which StarCraft I was an impediment of me almost not finishing grad school. Um, What's cool about this is it's 300 basic actions per move. Um, you're, it's a real-time strategy game. You're out there collecting resources. You have to mine minerals. Um, you're building little towns. You're building uh, either you have to decide you want to build a whole bunch of uh, research and have high-tech units to war with your opponent. Um, do you want to have low-tech units and lots of them? It, it's, it's a challenging game. So Blizzard has gone out and created an API that allows the DeepMind algorithm to be able to play the game as a human would. So you get, you get accurate fog of war, so you have to go and get visual intel and such. But what this is is a more complicated, more real world application that again is being solved by a general purpose AI. So when we go back a little bit more to uh, a standard neural network, um, what's cool about this is the fact that this is a simplified explanation of how deep learning works. So we have a picture on the left hand side, that's a dog curled up in a little laundry basket and the question is, is it, is it a dog or cat? So we have an input layer, we have just math for activated neurons to simulate the human brain and then we have an output layer and we're able to train against this model to make a determination of whether it's a cat or a dog. So in terms of the image net comp um, competition, as you can see this is 2015, it's actually better, we're roughly 97% accuracy now. Uh, I'll talk about ImageNet in just a moment, but the idea of being able to have computer vision and machine learning that can classify image more, images more accurately than human can, humans can, I, I find really compelling. Um, so Google Translate, um, so I, in my job I have to travel, uh, so I've been places where I obviously don't speak Japanese or Korean or you know, some of the different languages in the different com countries that I visit. However, I've been able to use this free app um, and I've been able to um, speak into it or type into it and, and get a response out of it. However, with the phase-based, more pattern matching system, you can only get so far with it. So if people used our translate function a couple of years ago, uh, pre sort of December 2016, um, you used this phase, uh, phrase-based system. So we decided that in order to move forward, we needed to have a neural net based system, which really gives you a step function. And you can see in these graphs, you get significantly closer to human speech um, with this new neural net functionality. So we started with a few languages. We have a significant number of them are now all available on neural net. Um, this is just a, uh, an example of a neural machine translation um, with an encoder function. Um, and then you're able to get the phrase you want from it. So just as an aside, um, the ability to, ha to use this translate even on a native language that you're with, um, this was originally launched as an April Fool's joke in, in 2009, the idea of being able to have automated replies in your email. Uh, if anyone here, so anyone here, an e inbox user um, who actually uses these, um, I, I, I do, um, it's, it says 12%, um, the number is actually slightly higher today. Um, this is just an example of using AI in a simplified fashion today and not waiting for the latest, latest final general purpose AI, but actually being able to apply what we can do today. So the graph that I showed you in the depiction with the cat, uh, sorry, I should say the dog in the laundry basket, um, this is a result of machine learning expertise with a large data set and a significant amount of computation. But what you'll find is it takes a, it's, it's actually a fair amount of work and you do need to know what you're doing in order to get something working really compelling um, in TensorFlow for a large data set that has a trainable outcome that is useful to you. Um, you it's easy to start with it, but again, the, some of the best work in the industry is being done by people with significant experience as well. So the, it begs the question, what if you had the computer create the graph for you? Right now, if I want to do image classification and I have a fair amount of time, I can create my own graph. But the highest likelihood is I'm going to go over and grab Sarah's graph because she did a really great job on it and I'm going to use it and apply it to the image data set that I want to use. And I'm going to get a good result. But again, if I have the computer go through and create the data graph, then what do we end up with? A lot of com com computation, but we end up with something called AutoML. So this is a depiction of the controller going through and running roughly 20,000 iterations to iterate on the most accurate model. And in this case, you can see we have a variety of success. We have anything from 75%, 61, not so great, but 97%. And what we found is this gives you significantly better performance. The graph is smaller. It runs on fewer resources, and it's significantly more accurate. So we're, what, what we're 
expecting to be is a greater adoption of machine learning technology by having the AutoML capability to create that graph for you that's optimized and then feed it your data set and move forward from there. So I mentioned ImageNet earlier. Some of Feifei's earlier work in 2012 um, had to do with ImageNet and the founding of this. And the idea is you can't actually have an apples to apples comparison. You know, how, how good is your graph versus my graph? And there's a variety of different, you know, the algorithms are understood, but there's a, a number of frameworks available. So the idea was to come up and create this ImageNet it's 1.2 images, 1.2 million images, excuse me, uh, in a thousand categories. And then each year you do, there's a competition to be able to go through um, and make a classification and figure out how accurate you are. And that's when I mentioned earlier that we were at roughly 97% with the computer models. I mean, that's astounding when you look at where we are just five years ago. So this is a depiction of those models, and you can see, so on the x-axis it's model size, and on the y-axis it's model accuracy. Um, and then, again, the idea that you're able to get this level of performance out of incredibly efficient and small computational um, requirements in order to get there, I think is really the compelling element. It allows you to create a graph, use huge amounts of compute to do it, and then be able to execute that graph on more restricted compute capability. We'll see if we can get the video to play. Uh, it should autoplay, I'm hopeful. Uh, some level of success, we'll try. Nope, okay, fail on that. Um, so what you could see if the video did play um, would be a room full of these robots, and, the, and th this is just an idea of what can you use, use machine learning for today? Well, if you're on set and you want a robot to be able to pick something up, you don't wanna have to make a custom new thing every time you wanna do something. So instead, all of these robots are reaching around and grabbing into a, an, into a container like they're two-year-olds or three-year-olds, and they're picking things up. Some of them are hard, some of them are slippery, some of them are spongy and rubbery and such, and it's a computer vision machine learning feedback loop, uh, and and there's probably 30 of these robots in the room. Um, this is a um, observation technique where there's no, it's, it's, there's no human supervision in it. So there's just a video input of um, a man doing a bunch of moves, there's a computer simulation that gets run, and then the real robot is driven by this. So this is just an example of how do you take and make general purpose robot technology from machine learning. This can be applied to a variety of fields, but I, I thought this was some cool research. And from a media entertainment art standpoint, I'm sure we've all seen uh, computer graphics with you know, Starry Night with an input of a, of a standard photograph, but significant amount of compute to give the style of a classic. I'm gonna get rid of that cursor because that's annoying. So the question comes down to, how do you, how do, you do all this? How do you, how do you make it quickly? Um, Jeff Dean, uh, who's a senior fellow at Google, um, he, who is running our machine learning efforts for artificial intelligence, uh, he produced this quote. When I first read it, I didn't have context for it, and that was if everyone spoke on their phone, what, what, what does that mean? So the context for this is um, Android phones, the OS is free, um, and we also have free applications for iOS, but the idea is if everyone picks up the telephone and speaks into Google Translate to try and translate to another language, uh, we won't have the compute to do that. You know, on a planetary scale, there isn't enough. So there needed to be a solution to be able to solve that problem. And so the solution was a TensorFlow processing unit. We're all familiar with CPUs. People understand GPUs as well. Uh, again, it's a reduced instruction set, but a crazy number of cores. Um, if you want to scale beyond that, you want to grab an FPGA, which would be a field programmable gate array, and that's just a nice piece of specialized hardware. You can take the software you've written and compile directly for it, and now you essentially have logic gates in hardware. They're great, they're expensive, they don't deploy at scale, but they let you run your code incredibly quickly. However, if you want to do this at scale from a cost, power, and thermal efficiency standpoint, you want to make what's called an ASIC, which is an application-specific integrated circuit. Why do we care about this? Well, this provides us the ability to execute very specific code ridiculously fast. We're talking 15 to 30 times faster than the GPU, so multiple orders of magnitude. And most interesting, you can see how tightly all of that is packed on the, on, on the side of the slide here. You can't just keep building quad size data centers. You, you can stack them high and make them huge, you, but you can't sustain that. So in this situation, you wanna be capable of running incredibly high compute densities, but in very, very compact physical space as well as thermal and power efficiency. To give you an example, the AlphaGo reference I made earlier with 48 TensorFlow processing units, TPUs, the AlphaGo Zero variant ran in four TensorFlow processing units, so a single board. So the idea of being able to say, 
We needed a whole bunch of compute. Now with 180 teraflops per TPU, you're in a scenario where you can literally rent supercomputing capabilities for, for pennies. And I'm excited about what that looks like for this field moving forward. So this is just a shot of a data center, and I threw this in because I wanted to talk about scale. Um, I've made pictures for a long time, and the context of doing that We've always had to have a whole bunch of compute, but we've always talked about it in terms of how many cores do you have? Well, we've got 50,000 cores at this facility and 20,000 cores overseas, and we have to shuffle things back and forth to make them. When we talk internally, we talk in terms, not a number of cores, but in terms of megawatts for a facility, because we're running both a combination of CPU and GPU, as well as TPU and other accelerators that give you the ability to have greater and more efficiency for your densities. You'll notice as well um, the amount of deep learning directories, 2017 now, over 5,000 plus, um, used across products right across our product line, and most of the customers I work with are looking to see how they can deploy machine learning on individual case basis uh, into their stack. Now, forgive me for the slightly commercial slide. People did ask when I gave them uh, a preview of this presentation, where are we today and what, what can we do? Well, we do have APIs you can hit on the left-hand side for images, motion, um, for movies, for, um, for textual, um, as well as for audio. Uh, the ML platform in the middle provides you the ability to build your own, and then we also have ML libraries with our open source TensorFlow hardware accelerators, and we can assist you with professional services. So moving back to research time. So ML applications in media. This is an area that's near and dear to my heart. I jumped out of production because I wanted to try and change how the industry worked, but I couldn't do it from the inside. So instead of saying, let's get all the way to the end of the pipeline, where the imagery is complete, we're, we're out of DI, and we want to go for distribution, instead I wanted to say, how do we back this up and insert machine learning at the entire production cycle? So I wanted to take camera raw from every camera, and I wanted to be able to, to throw that in, use something like Colorfront to debayer it, run a machine learning pass to be able to go through and generate metadata on it and JSON, throw it into your MAM, do a transcode and produce dailies. That lets you then decentralize your editorial process. So you can be shooting in the field somewhere and then have your editorial staff be in London or New York and have the directorial staff, you know, the director can be in Tokyo or London or LA, wherever they want to be. If your visual effects work is fairly minor, you're doing some image replacement, little augmentation, you can get by with using some compute. But if you want to put a dragon in your scene, you're going to need fluid simulation, deep compositing and such. Uh, in order to do that, um, you need to have tremendous scale. Uh, the, the savings is for us to be able to save human time. That's the most expensive part of this. It's really expensive to have, as you know, visual effects, production, director, uh, time on set to do it, and then time on set for VFX. The idea of being able to take the, the DI color correction pass and have that virtualized through remote desktop. Again, what we're doing is taking the entire production pipeline, be it for episodic television or feature film or feature animation, and be able to remote it and make that available globally. And the photographs come out. This is great. Okay, so I'll fire the, the final slide. So this is the one you want to shoot the photo if you actually want the definitive build. Um, what this is providing you is the idea of saying camera raw all the way to disaster long-term archive. And what this provides you with is the ability to get anything back in a couple of milliseconds, but the ability as well to have global access to it. So we want to provide a framework where you can hire any people you want globally to do this kind of work. And, we, and, and we're working to build in machine learning at each and every step along the way to provide not only image analysis and such, but automatic scene breakout and provide an efficient way to generate an EDL and then um, um, provide the edit and then transcode that into the correct flavors based on what people used before and such. So ML at every step of the way is where we're going with this. Um, we have a ridiculous global network that lets you move the data around, which we, I'll put it back if you want to shoot photos, sorry. Um, I, I nerded out on the fact that we put a 60 terabit link in between the US and Asia. I thought that was pretty cool. Great, thanks. Um, Again, if you're excited about how this works and how the TPUs can talk to each other, um, how we can get you know, four TPUs working together to provide AlphaGo Zero, I encourage you to Google Jupyter Network, and that'll give you a roughly 2012 um, circa 15-page research document that explains how the top of rack switches work and what the network topology looks like, how the NICs are architected, and that also provides you with uh, just an awareness of the full software-defined networking stack as well as hardware. So, I took a couple of image-based use cases out, as this is SMPTE. Um, 
I thought this was a cool application. There's a major insurer in the US that if you do have an accident with your car, and that does happen here in LA, the idea of taking some pictures of it, and I think this is a good application for ML. You know, it's hard to describe, perhaps, how much damage there was to the car. But the idea here is that you can take a picture, and I realize these are polarized images, but you can take a picture of the damage of the vehicle and get an indication of, through an ML, um, graph, what kind of damage there is, how serious is this, does the person need a rental car, and what are we looking at? Um, Descartes Labs, they an analyzed satellite data and were able to come up with a, um, roughly 2% accuracy five months in advance of the USDA report. So if you're trading corn futures, this is relevant. But in terms of being able to spin this back around from a media use case, the idea of being able to analyze large data sets and get accuracy from that um, we're, again, really excited about some of the compelling use cases that come out of this. Airbus is an example. Um, you'll notice on the image on the left, that's the image, and the question is, are those clouds or is that snowpack? That makes a huge difference if you're looking at water runoff and you're looking at what crop water availability you may have. So they built an ML model that will go through, significantly improve the accuracy. It's not just the accuracy, it's the speed. It's a saving in human time and the ability to be able to automatically process these images. If you want to bring additional satellites online to have quicker coverage of the Earth, then you're in a scenario where you can do that at scale. I thought this was cool from a visualization standpoint. So we have a small island in the Pacific. We have a bunch of transponder data and a whole bunch of ships transiting their area. Um, I'm originally from Canada. They had to shut down the fisheries on the East Coast at one point due to overfishing. And in this scenario, this small island was having its waters fished. So this visualization technology uh, as well as the machine learning algorithm that was employed, allowed them to make a determination of the patterns the ships were moving in. They weren't just transiting the area. Certain types of drift net fishing and such derived different outputs. So they were able to use this visualization technique to determine if a boat was fishing it or if a boat was just transiting the area. I really love this example. This is a Japanese family. They have a cucumber farm. And they decided to code on their own in TensorFlow a simple graph. It took them days and days to be able to make a determination. You can see there's all these different cucumbers in the middle. They were hand sorting these. So they had all the cucumbers and they were hand sorting the cucumbers into different bins in order to sell to the market because the Japanese are very specific about their cucumbers and the color and shape and size and, and straightness and all of that. So they used TensorFlow to derive a machine learning algorithm with computer vision. They basically put a camera on the conveyor belt and the system auto sorts the cucumbers for them. Accuracy is extremely high and they're able to go to market with this. So I'm, I'm encouraging everyone in the room who's excited about this conceptually to be able to imagine the problems that you're dealing with day to day. How can you apply machine learning in a very simple way to be able to achieve either greater scalability, greater performance, or reduce the amount of time, greater accuracy, you know, this technology is here today. Um, it's available. Um, TensorFlow is open source. You can run it on any cloud you want on your laptop. Just compile and go. And there's resources to use it. So again, I really like this example because it's just regular people like us who are, who are applying machine learning uh, in their day-to-day -day life for their business for greater success. So in terms of why do I feel this is the future? Well, you can look back, and this is one of those you know, human advancement graphs, um, but we had an exponential growth, and we all know when that was. That's the Industrial Revolution. The steam engine happened here, which freed us from the manual capabilities of having to build everything by hand, and we suddenly had mechanized ability. So the idea is if Industrial Revolution saved us from physical drudgery, how do we get past mental drudgery? And that's where we see ML coming along, the ability to empower humans and be able to move forward the technology and capabilities we have and to do so uh, in a shorter amount of time. Thank you so much for having me today. So I just hope that it has cleared a couple of questions. Um, or do you think that's even more confusing now? Well, it makes, it seems it's a lot of fun stuff as well. Um, playing games in order to introduce machine learning, isn't it? And sorting out cucumbers and stuff. Um, so certainly there are challenges for us in the media industry. Um, not dealing with cucumbers, but with files and data and lots about those things. I like to introduce now our next speaker. Um, it's 
where is he? Jay Yogeshwar. Um, I like to call him on the stage. He is the director of media and entertainment at Hitachi Data Systems, and he will talk about um, some of the challenges for the media industry, especially in the digital transformation um, for the production and content creation industry. So, welcome, Jay. Thank you. Thanks.